Well, that's, that's really the heart of this passage, but it does um, make for a pretty strange verse when you think about it. Um, verse 11 again. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee, um, he, um, through which he reveals his glory. Um, it seems a strange verse. In, in some ways, a bit of a disappointing verse. Glory, something to believe in here. I guess that one way or another, we've all come to see Jesus' glory this morning. I mean, if you're not a Christian, you probably wouldn't put it that way. But you're thinking to yourself, is, this, is the fuss really worth it? Is there anything here worthy of my time? Um, what is the fuss all about? Is there any glory to be found here? As you heard um, this story read, I wonder if you glimpsed any of it. it. It seems pretty mundane. It seems some sort of party trick is happening. A wedding's been saved. Some water's been turned into wine. Where is the glory here? What is there to believe in? here. If you're a believer here this morning, um, I would imagine that you have come here not just to spend time with your church family, but to see the glory of the Lord, to be changed a little by glimpsing his glory. So I wonder how this story um, feels to you. It might well be a really um, familiar one, and one that perhaps has never made much of an impression uh, on you. Um, some of the other miracles would be the great ones, wouldn't they? The feeding of the 5,000, the raising of the dead, the calming of the storm. Makes you wonder why John would choose this one and why this one at the start of his gospel. Later on, um, he will tell you that Jesus did so many incredible things, we wouldn't be able to write them all down. What he's had to do is he's had to narrow it down. He's trying to give us Jesus' greatest hits, top ten. And what are you going to do if you're presenting just a very select few? Well, I would guess you're going to get some great opening number, aren't you? You want to start with a big one. And yet the opening number to John's gospel is Jesus turning water into wine. Seems strange. Where is the glory here? Well, that's the question I want to try and answer this morning um, and for us to, to glimpse a little more. Um, to do that, we're going to um, realize that this miracle is a sign. Um, there are things here, just like on a sign, that point you away from itself to something else. This is telling you about that. It's a sign that is pointing us. And there are three things in particular um, that we're going to see that are going to help us point to the glory of Jesus, to see it for ourselves. We're going to think about the water, we're going to think about the wine, and we're going to think about the wedding. Water, wine, and wedding. And first of all, water. Um, if you're a guest um, here at this wedding, you, you come in, and one of the first things that you see are there in verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each um, holding from 80 to 120 liters. When John lingers on a detail like that and gives you quite a lot of information, he wants you to pay some attention to this theme of water. And they're probably there in the courtyard, and they're used and before eating any kind of meal, um, especially here um, at something like a wedding. Uh, it's the kind of thing Jesus talks about in, in Mark chapter 7, and this, these ceremonial washings. And there we read, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. And the traditions of the Jews, ceremonial washing. Something that actually has its basis in the Old Testament. Um, not just traditions, but the Old Testament itself. Um, constantly taught the Jewish people to be clean, um, to wash regularly. Um, I did a quick count of um, how many times you get commands or descriptions of washings in Exodus and Leviticus. 55 times, and they're told in different ways, in different circumstances, to wash. Why are those there? Well, um, the Old Testament makes really clear um, that they are pointers to something, but they are lacking in themselves. Um, one of the things you learn by having to do this over and over again is you keep needing washing. You never stay clean. Um, every mealtime, even here at a wedding, would be the reminder that once again you need to be made clean. 
these washings then, were temporary. Um, They're also outward, really just a picture of how we need to be made clean on the inside. God has said to his people all along, the whole system designed to show um, it is impossible to stay clean, that the cleansing we need is going to have to be something that works on our inside, something that is more than temporary. Um, so why God um, in Isaiah commands his people to wash. Um, here, I'm um, using that language to talk about something inward. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. To wash is a picture of stopping doing evil. Um, in some places we see a command like that. And in other places in the Old Testament it becomes a promise. Um, here's Ezekiel chapter 36. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Big theme in the Old Testament, the need to be clean, all of these regular washings, um, and um, the promise that God is going to come and make us clean. Now, what has all of that got to do with what we're reading here in John? Well, I wonder if you can see what Jesus is doing. He's doing something very striking. Here are six stone water jars. And what does he say in verse 7? Knowing that they've run out of wine, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he turns them into wine jars. He's repurposing them. He's upcycling them. He is turning them to a new purpose. He's saying, we don't need that water anymore. That water is no longer needed. We can use those for wine. It's a sign that those promises of Ezekiel 36 are being fulfilled, um, that that washing, that that cleansing, is not something that needs to be there anymore now that he has come. It's hinted at. I know it's just a hint here. As John draws our attention to these water jars filled for ceremonial washing, and then they get turned into something else, later Jesus will be much clearer about this. Um, He will speak about how um, unless he washes us, we have no part of him. He speaks to his disciples about about how they are already clean because of the word he has spoken to them. Jesus is the one who can make us clean. That's the first way in which we might see his glory here this morning. But I guess um, to see that as glorious, we need to know that that's something that we need, don't we? It won't seem glorious otherwise, um, unless we acknowledge that we are not ourselves clean. It's not a comfortable thing to see. Um, We all of us, don't we? We live with that that knowledge that there is a gap between what people see and who we really are. And that's not a nice gap to concentrate on, is it? You know all of the ways in which you are worse than people really think they really saw. It's like a shadow that sits behind us. And that's an image that comes from somebody I was um, reading recently, not a Christian, but um, her name was uh, Mary Louise von Franz. Um, Writing in the last century, she spoke about this idea of a shadow, a shadow that we all have behind us. She describes what it's like to have on screen to to try and glimpse that shadow behind you. When When someone someone makes an attempt to see their shadow, shadow, they they become become aware of and often ashamed of those qualities and impulses they deny in themselves, but can plainly see in others, such things as egotism, mental laziness and sloppiness, unreal fantasies, schemes and plots, carelessness and cowardice, distorted love of money and possessions. Those things that we look at other people and we see them so often and we look down on them and we despise them and we, and we see the damage that they do, But then we just catch that glimpse behind ourselves of all those same things, that shadow behind us. I wonder if any of that rings true for you. Now, what gets really interesting with with Mary Louise von Franz is um, when she starts talking about what we might do about it, she describes this shadow really powerfully, and then she tells you it is basically impossible for you to fix for yourselves. Again, not a Christian, but she knows this. Um, She says you'd have to be like Hercules, um, that great hero from Greek myths. She says you'd have to be like some great hero. And she's got one of the the famous labors that he did in mind. And she's thinking about Hercules and one of the tasks that he set. 
This unfortunate hero's task was to clean up in one day the Georgina's stables, in which hundreds of cattle had dropped their dung for many decades. A task so enormous that the ordinary mortal would be overcome by discouragement at the mere thought of it. Wow. <laughs> See what she's saying? Each of us carry the shadow around. And to deal with it, it is like dealing with a cattle shed that is so filled up with decades of dung. It is nothing that we can fix for ourselves. It would take a Hercules or more. Well, what Jesus wants us to know um, here as he performs this sign is that this might be an impossible task for us. There is not enough water in the world to wash us clean. But Jesus is saying he has come to do that. All of those ceremonial washings, they can end because he is here. This miracle points to the glory of Jesus because he is the one who can make us clean. So water. Let's think now about wine for a moment. Um, why does Jesus turn water particularly into wine? Now, you might say, well, that's what they'd run out of. That's what they were hoping for. Um, and of course, that's true. Um, but again, if we, if we know the Old Testament well, then we will see the significance of this. That for Jesus to put away the, uh, the waters for washing and to provide abundant wine, that would be a really significant thing. It would be a sign that points somewhere if we know a bit more about wine in the Old Testament. Well, let's um, see, where does wine come in the Old Testament? It comes in two situations in particular. Um, when God's people are under judgment for their sin, you're often told about the wine supplies. And um, here's Isaiah. Verse 24, uh, chapter 24. The earth is defiled by its people. The new wine dries up and the vine withers. All the merrymakers groan. The gaiety of the tambourines is stilled. The noise of the revelers has stopped. The joyful heart is silent. No longer do they drink wine with song. The beer is bitter, but they good wind to its drinkers. The ruined cities lie desolate. The entrance to every house is barred. In the streets, they cry out for wine. In the Old Testament, to be without wine is to be a, it's a picture of suffering. And to suffer the effects of sin, to be under God's judgment. A time when there is no feasting, no joy, nothing to celebrate. But then the, Old, then the Old Testament also talks about wine in the context of forgiveness and restoration. When God does something about that, when he transforms the people and their circumstances, then you're told the wine is going to flow. And here's an example of that from Amos chapter 9. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people Israel. They will, they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in our own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Amos says that when God puts away his people's sin, and when the judgment is passed, then he will restore his people, and the wine is going to flow. Surprise that comes up loads in the Old Testament, and it's what we're supposed to see signaled here. Um, not just that waters of cleansing are no longer needed, but now is the time for abundant feasting and joy. It's one of the other great details of this passage. Do you remember? How much do these water, jar water jars contain? 80 to 120 liters. That's 780 bottles of wine. Try and picture those in a moment for yourself. Um, at one wedding, 780, towards the end of the evening, bottles of the finest wine. Um, again, one more promise from the Old Testament um, that helps us tap into this, Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. What does Jesus serve up here at the end? The best that has been saved to last. So Jesus, in uh, performing this sign and in turning those water jars into new use, in filling them with the finest of wine, Jesus is saying that this new age has arrived. 
from water to wine, from judgment to joy, from shame to celebration. That's what reveals Jesus' glory here. A joy, a celebration that comes from knowing we have been washed clean, we are reconciled with God. There are so many stories that we could tell of people discovering that for themselves, to know that they've been made clean and to know the joy and celebration that comes from that. And one um, story I've um, come across recently is the, um, the story of Stephen Lungu. Um, he's a man who was uh, growing up in Zimbabwe, um, who was um, abandoned by his parents and grew up on the street. Um, he fell into, um, into gangs, um, and um, his, um, the most significant visit to a church um, was when he was carrying petrol bombs to go and bomb it. Um, but as he goes um, to that church, um, he hears a verse, a verse from Psalm 27. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. And he sits and he talks with the pastor and he comes to realize that um, though that's been his experience, that his father and mother have forsaken him, he hears about the love of the Lord and so he prays. Is what he says. I knelt to approach God for the first time in my life. God, I cried, I have nothing. I am nothing. I can't read. I can't write. My total inadequacy choked me. My parents don't want me. Take me up, God. Take me up. I'm sorry for the bad things I've done. Jesus, forgive me and take me now. And then he says, immediately, I felt as if a heavy burden had rolled off my back. There was a tremendous rush of relief and peace. I was astonished by the joy that flowed through me. Me, a thrown away child among the millions of Africa, but Jesus had found me. The joy that comes from knowing God's favor, discovering his salvation, that same story told over and over again in the lives of God's people. How the fatherless find a father, how the shamed find shelter, how the unlovely find that they are loved. There is water, there is cleansing, there is wine, there is joy that comes through Jesus. And then finally, there is wedding, a wedding. And this, I think, probably takes us even closer in to understand the glory of Jesus. So what we're going to see is that the joy we're talking about is really best described as a marriage. And that's where the Bible ends. And we've heard those promises already of great feasts and celebrations to come on that final day, and that mountain from Isaiah that's going to be laid with the finest food, um, much like um, a Canadian Thanksgiving um, that we're going to enjoy over lunch today. This great feast that is to come. And as you get to, um, to the end of the Bible, you realize that that feast is not just any feast, but it is um, a wedding, a wedding banquet where Jesus and his people are going to be united together. And some verses from Revelation 19. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. One of the world's great promises is that in the end, God and his people are going to be united together. It's going to be like a wedding. And what John wants to point to here in John chapter 2 is that idea that Jesus is the one who is going to come and take his people as a bride. How, how do we get there? Um, he's not getting married in this passage. I realize that. Um, but let's go back to the story um, and have a look at verse 9. The question I want you to think about as I read verse 9 is, whose job is it to provide the wine? Okay. Jesus has just said to these servants, draw some water out, take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who were drawn, drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have already had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. 
Who gets the credit for providing the wine? The bridegroom. Because at that time, that's who was responsible for laying on the great feast. It was the bridegroom's job. As a father of three daughters, I think that's a fantastic idea. <laughs> it's the groom whose job is to lay on the finest of wines. And this bridegroom, well, he must be pretty confused by all of this because he's saying, I've got no idea. I don't know what's going on. But Jesus, what's he done? He stepped into the role of the groom. He's taken on his responsibility. He's fulfilled his role by providing this wine. Again, it is just a hint, but it's going to become more explicit. Um, just in the next chapter of John, uh, John the Baptist is going to talk about Jesus. He's going to talk about him as the bridegroom. And um, so in chapter 3, verse 29, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it's now complete. John the Baptist is saying, look, my job here is to be the best man. I'm the best man. Jesus is the groom and the bride is for him. Um, so in just the next chapter, Jesus is really clearly going to be identified as the groom, the one who is going to give his life for his bride, the one who is going to wash her clean by his blood. That's where this sign is pointing to. As um, Jesus says in that um, strange little conversation with his mother, when she comes to him and says they have no more wine, he says, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Might seem a strange and slightly rude way to talk to your mother. Um, ask me a bit more about it later on. But the key thing is this. He says, my hour has not yet come. In John's gospel, his hour is going to be his time when he does offer himself for the sins of the world. And Jesus is saying, the time has not come for that yet, but here will be a sign of what he will accomplish, how he will be this great bridegroom who offers himself to win for himself a bride, to cleanse her for himself. So here I think, here is where the glory of Jesus becomes clearest. It is not just that what he offers us is forgiveness, a clean slate, and then sends us off on our way. Rather, what we are promised is a relationship with him that lasts forever. He is the great bridegroom to his people. And one of the, the Bible's favorite pictures then is of this wedding. It's so helpful and something to, um, to keep in mind as we think of and what we have in Jesus. Um, we've heard already about one engagement uh, that's been announced this, um, this morning. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, many of us will be at a wedding what are you going to see there at that wedding? Well, you're going to see a spotless and radiant bride, and you're going to see a husband who would do anything for his wife. And all of that will be a beautiful picture of how the Christian story ends. Of course, we know that um, here and now, not every marriage between a man and a woman has its happily ever after. But marriage in all of its imperfections, is a picture for us of Jesus' love for his church. However broken our relationships are here, whether or not we get married, we can lift our eyes this morning to Jesus, to his glory as the bridegroom for his people, as the one who cleanses a bride and takes her to himself, to glimpse his glory here at the start of his ministry, to imagine him there at the front of the church, there at the altar. Will you love her, comfort her, honor and protect her, and forsaking all others, be faithful to her as long as you both shall live? And Jesus says, yes, I will. And everything we see about him in his life, in his sufferings, proves that word true. We can, in our mind's eye, hear him making that unbreakable promise. With my body, I honor you. All that I am, I give to you. All that I have, I share with you. Jesus' words to his church, to us this morning. The glory of Jesus in water, in wine, and in wedding. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we praise you that the coming of Jesus means water turns to wine. 
um, that um, we we can know that we are cleansed, that that shadow is cleared, and that our guilt is removed, that that stain is cleansed, that through Jesus, that great bridegroom, um, he is preparing a bride for himself who is spotless and perfect, and that not not through our own efforts of cleaning ourselves up, but through um, his blood washing us clean. Father, we praise you that we know where this world is going. Whatever our experiences are in this world, we can know that following Jesus, we will be with him forever. He will never leave us or forsake us. Um, He will comfort, honor, protect, and be faithful to us for all eternity. Father, we praise you for him. Amen.